Today's scripture is from the book of Numbers, chapter 11, verses 4 through 6, 10 through 16, and 24 through 29. The camp followers with them had a strong craving, and the Israelites also wept again and said, If we only had meat to eat, remember the fish we used to eat in Egypt for nothing? The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up, and there is nothing but this manna to look at. Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families, all at the entrances of their tent. Then the Lord became angry, and Moses was displeased. So Moses said to the Lord, Why have you treated your servants so badly? Have I not found favor in your sight that you lay the burden of all this people on me? Did I conceive this people? Did I give birth to them that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a wet nurse carries a nursing child to the land that you promised on oath to their ancestors? Where am I to get meat to give to all this people? For they come weeping to me saying, give us meat to eat. I am not able to carry all this people alone for they are too heavy for me. If this is the way you are going to treat me, put me to death at once. If I have found favor in your sight and do not let me see my misery. So the Lord said to Moses, gather for me 70 of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and the officers over them. Bring them to the tent of meeting and have them take their place there with you. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and he gathered 70 of the elders of the people and placed them all around the tent. Then the Lord came down in a cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied, but they did not do so again. Two men had remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named Medad, and the spirit rested on them. They were among those registers, but they had not gone out to the tent. So they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, son of Nun, the assistant of Moses, one of, the, one of his chosen men, said, my Lord Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. For the word of God of scriptures, in scriptures, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Good morning. As I begin my sermon, I wanted to give you 
a fair warning that the God presented in Numbers 11 is very likely a God that you may struggle with. I speak from experience this week. You know, sometimes my sermon writing process feels like I'm guided by this gentle spirit through a lovely green meadow, filled with inspiration. And as I'm typing on my computer, I hear some lovely classical music, and bunnies are hopping up to me, and birds are landing on my shoulder. And sometimes, like this past week, I am in a wrestling match with scripture. I'm sweating. I'm agitated. I'm saying, I don't understand you, and why? I hear that music that my husband listens to, where guys are screaming to the rhythms of electric guitar and drums. I feel like Jacob, wrestling with the mysterious being in Peniel. Either way, I'm engaged with the text. And being able to remain engaged with the text, with all of your questions, concerns, anger, confusion, is to allow your faith to be big enough for all of it. It takes a lot of strength and courage to do so. And this won't be a sermon that ties everything neat in a bow for you, that colors scripture in nice, black and white colors. This is a messy scripture, and my exegesis feels a bit messy. But we are here. We are present. And together we can strive for a big faith that holds all of our wonderings, our questions, our frustration. With that spirit, we enter this text. So the book of Numbers gets its title from the census that starts the book. But the Hebrew name for the book is Bimibar, in the wilderness. I like that so much better. As a side note, how cool would it be if we could rename books of the Bible that are more than one word titles? That would be a fun creative writing project. But this is a text where all parties are not on their best behavior. And this is a text where God is my least favorite character. And Old Testament texts, they often present a wrathful God that I struggle with. And I don't often view God as petty, but this story presents that struggle. Let me to explain. The scripture plops us right in the middle of the wilderness wandering of the Israelites. 600,000 people led by Moses. And God certainly leads them and protects them. Numbers 9 states that when the congregation tent was finally erected and assembled, the cloud of the presence of God covered it in the place where the terms of the covenant were kept. In the dark of night, the presence of God looked like a fire and marked the spot until morning. And so it continued, cloud cover by day, and something like fiery storm clouds at night. Whenever the cloud lifted up, the Israelites would pack up and move, and where the cloud stopped, they would settle. But things at this point are really difficult for everyone. It's like when you're on a road trip. And as the trip progresses, you get a little worn down. You're tired of being on the move, staying in different places, living out of your luggage. You don't have any time alone, and everyone around you starts to annoy you. Except on this trip, you are walking, camping, and staying in new places frequently for 40 years. Now, camping just for two days makes me grumpy. 
I know. I live in Colorado, and I don't love camping. <laughs> Sorry. 40 years without the comfort of one singular home, you eat the exact same thing every day. And you're not allowed to save any of it because it will go bad, so you don't know when your next meal is going to come from. And in response to your needed venting, even if it's under your breath, God brings down fire on your camp. Many times we look at this story and think, man, those Israelites are good-for-nothing complainers. In fact, just a few years ago, I preached a sermon to that effect. But with my perspective, coming from a culture that says it's okay to have limits, it's okay to vent, it's okay to be, not be able to handle every bad situation, I totally get their complaints. Not that they are completely free of blame, not that they aren't ungrateful in some way, but I get it. The wilderness is hard. As Will Gaffney, a womanist biblical scholar, says, God is in a smiting mood. I can understand God's anger, too. The people God rescued from slavery are nonstop complainers, driving God's beloved Moses to the brink of insanity. And by asking for meat, they are rejecting the gift of manna, God providing for them in the wilderness. But simply by interceding on their behalf, after God brings down fire that devours people on the edge of the camp, you'll notice in our scripture it is bits and pieces, but if you read the whole chapter, it gives you a wider view. Just by interceding on their behalf, Moses is noting that God's behavior is a little unnecessary. Can you imagine feeling like the divine creator that you worship lacks some compassion, maybe some impulse control, and you need a chat? But Moses is not doing well either. He goes on this rant to God. Did I conceive all these people, God? Did I give birth to them that you should say to me, Carry them in your bosom as a wet nurse carries a nursing child to the land you promised on oath to their ancestors. Where am I to get meat for these people? For they come weeping to me saying, give us meat to eat. I am not able to carry all these people alone for they are too heavy for me. And if this is the way you are going to treat me, Put me to death at once, if I have found favor in your sight, and do not let me see my misery. Moses is basically saying, I am their leader, but I'm not their parent. I can't possibly care for their every need. I am not a short order cook, hearing them complain about what they're eating and make them a dinner that they will eat. I did not sign up to be dad to 600,000 people. You asked me to rescue them from Pharaoh and to bring them out of Egypt, but you did not ask me to carry the heavy burden of their complaints, needs, and emotions. And if you're going to treat me like this, put me to death at once. <sighs> All right, everyone just needs to take a breath. Take a breath, Moses. One fascinating thing about Moses' interaction with God here is he uses the feminine pronoun for God, which makes his reference to birth and breastfeeding more profound. Will Gaffney says, Moses has called God a woman, or better contextually, a mother, one who needs to come get her kids. I'm sure Moses is absolutely exhausted. He is the intercessor, the mediator between the divine God and a huge population of people. 
And I'm sure at times it feels like he is the only one ensuring they make it out alive. And he's the mediator for this very unpredictable, wrathful God. Of course, Moses has interceded for the Israelites many times. In Exodus 33, Moses convinces God to keep leading and guiding them after they make the golden calf and worship it. An event that put quite a divide between the Israelites and God. In that same story, Moses convinces God to not destroy the Israelites. And in our scripture, it's, it's a bit odd because God is compassionate towards Moses and grants him his request for more help in carrying this immense burden. And God agrees to put God's spirit on 70 elders so they can prophesy and lead so that they too can hear God's voice and guide their people. And what's odd is God's response to the Israelite people in comparison to responding to Moses' request. Now God does grant the request from the Israelites to eat something different than manna, but not in a compassionate sense. God sends an immense amount of quails to fall on the camp, a day's journey's length on either side of the camp, two cubits deep, birds upon birds. And it's as if God said, you want meat, huh? Here you go. You'll be drowning in it. And verse 33 says, but while the meat was still between their teeth, before it was consumed, the anger of the Lord was kindled against the people, and the Lord struck the people with a very great plague. The event was so impactful that the place where they were eating is named Kibroth Hatava, meaning grave of cravings. Jeez, Louise. So as pastors, we take care in presenting scriptures that could cause harm to someone's theology or ethics. And so I include this musing that it is the Old Testament, which I love dearly, but it often makes me wonder about those theological elements that influence our view of events. Was God really this wrathful? And those who witnessed these events, what was their view of who God is? And did it influence these stories and writings? I am just as confused by God's anger as you are. And those questions around scripture and faith, those do not go away once you're ordained, friends. Like I said, this is a passage where everyone, everyone is struggling Everyone is struggles to funk, struggling to function. Everyone is different levels of irritable or overstimulated or hungry, worn out, scared, has completely lost sight of their own calling, gifts, and vision. Have you ever been in a situation like that? Have you ever been on a road trip like that? But one thing I notice the most is the complete lack of real connection that is happening. Connection between Moses and the Israelites, the Israelites and God, God and Moses. Moses desires his life to end. The Israelites are struggling to feel connected to their God, perhaps because Moses has been speaking to God on their behalf, but also it seems like every time they voice a need, they are punished. When we are not operating as our best selves, when our resources of patience and understanding, empathy and vision, creativity, or perhaps when we are literally hungry, thirsty, tired, cold, not enough caffeine, when these are depleted, our ability to truly connect with others is the first thing that goes out the window. Our brain goes into survival mode and just solving our crisis or conflict. 
And sometimes in our attempt to get through our conflict or hard situation, we let go of that value of connection. It's easier, right? Just let me solve this myself. Or I don't have time to connect with you right now. Just get me the thing I need. Or I'm really irritated with you. I don't want to deal with you anymore. One piece of parenting advice I have encountered is when you and your child are having a hard time, one helpful thing is to get on their level. Look them in the eye, connect with them. Remember that they are a tiny little person with needs. I do this with my daughter, and she pushes me away. I'm looking at Lorelai. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, she pushes me away at first, and I have a flash of anger, and for a moment I'm like, this parenting advice is stupid. But through her tears, she softens, and so do I. And this is the truth right here. I'm a better parent when I reach out to her for connection instead of trying to control everything and getting frustrated and lonely with the outcome, which with a toddler and a baby is never the outcome you want. So it's hard, but I strive for connection with her in those hard moments. Especially when we are experiencing moments of conflict or tension, it can feel like we're doing anything but connecting with that person or group. You know, think back to a recent conflict you had with someone, however big or small. Did it feel like you were connecting with that person? It's so difficult, right? How can we go through these times of immense conflict and still be connected to that person's dignity, needs, and personhood. It turns out that Moses had great intuition about what he needed. He was feeling so alone, so isolated from a people who were struggling, and he was struggling with managing his God's own anger. And he says, God, I can't do this on my own. I can't be the only one managing these people, managing you. Please, send me some help. Give me some of your spirit to other people. And it turns out Moses, who asked God for his life to end, knew connection to others is what keeps us alive. And there is scientific research to back this up. The National Institute of Health published that in a meta-analysis at Brigham Young University, they examined 148 articles published on the effects of human interactions on health outcomes. And they reported that social connections with friends, family, neighbors, or colleagues improves the odds of survival by 50%. Low social interaction was reported to be similar to smoking 15 cigarettes a day and to being an alcoholic, to be more harmful than not exercising, and to be twice as harmful as obesity. That surprised me. Connection is a major influence on our well-being. Connection is how we survive. And it's not just an aid to isolation and loneliness. It doesn't just fill a gap or immediate need. It doesn't just get us what we want. It is a life force that carries us. And Jane E. Dutton is an organizational researcher, and she studies high-quality connections and defines connection as the dynamic living tissue that exists between two people or groups where there is some contact between them involving mutual awareness and social interaction. The existence of some interaction means that individuals have affected one another in some way, giving connections a temporal as well as emotional dimension. Dynamic living tissue. The connection between us is a force that's alive. It's a relationship that is 
reminding us of our shared humanity, how we each have dignity, we deserve goodness and respect, we were made from goodness itself. Connection lets us see past what makes us different and what we disagree on helps us see each other as human. And it's an antidote, no, antidote to this culture that can suck the life out of us. Connection reminds us of this critical truth that we were not meant to live life alone. Let me say that again to our individualistic American culture. We were not meant to live this life alone. And as we close out September, we close out our study on center and connect, our two touchstone words. And these two practices bring us closer to thriving in our goodness, our tov miod, Hebrew phrase meaning very, very good, as God described humanity in its creation. And it's likely that you can identify with one word over the other. It's not a strict truth, but often introverts relate to centering and extroverts relate to connecting. But I challenge you today, what are areas in your life where you lack connection? Work, family, hobbies, craft club, it's a great hobby connection, even church. Are there areas where you just feel really burned out? And can you sense if you need connection there and how? Or are you like Moses and in a season of intense wilderness, stress, and conflict where you just feel so alone? How can you find that dynamic living tissue of connecting with others? Now, I did not ask for permission to share this. It's always a great start to a story, right? I was visiting Edith and Walter Rao once, and I noticed a note on your kitchen table, Walter. And it said, who can you connect with today? Who can you call? And I loved that, Edith and Walter. And I have thought about it a lot since. So many times, I'm just rushing through my day trying to get my to-do list accomplished, and I don't ask myself, who can I connect with today? What a delightful shift in priorities that gets me out of my head and preoccup preoccupation with myself and reminds me to take part in that life-saving practice of connecting with others. Who can you connect with today? Who can you call today? I would encourage you, Calvary, to look for connection in surprising places, perhaps with someone very different from yourself. I encourage you to never give up on finding connection in a certain situation. I encourage you to not assume that you don't need connection, especially in a hard season, for it's in that hard season that you need connection the most. Or perhaps, is there some conflict you are facing, especially in an election year? Can you entertain finding connection in that area? There's a song sung in the black church that I love called, I Need You, You Need Me, by Hezekiah Walker and the Love Fellowship Choir. I need you, you need me, we're all a part of God's body, stand with me, agree with me, we're all a part of God's body, it is his will that every need be supplied. You are important to me. I need you to survive. I need.
need you to survive. We need each other to survive. We each are image bearers of God, and we need each other, y'all. We need each other to survive and to thrive. So if you're struggling, I encourage you to find connection. Who can you connect with today? Reach out for it. Ask for it as Moses did. Strive for it. Amen.